Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone uh, this morning to the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform and the Subcommittee on Government Operations. And welcome them, uh, first of all, to our hearing this morning. Uh, this is a field hearing of the committee and subcommittee. And the title of this hearing is Assessing NASA's Underutilized Real Property Assets at the Kennedy Space Center. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, the Visitor Center for accommodating us today and NASA for uh, also their assistance of their Air Force uh, uh, for helping us. Uh, yesterday we had a tour of uh, the properties uh, of NASA and the Air Force uh, base. And uh, I'd like to welcome everyone. We're actually in Mr. Uh, Posey's district and adjacent to Mr. DeSantis' district. We're joined today by both Mr. Posey and Mr. DeSantis. Recognize them in a minute. Uh, and we also have Mr. Benavolio from Michigan, who is a member of the uh, Government Reform and Oversight Committee. We're also joined by the distinguished gentlelady from Michigan, who chairs the House Administration Committee. Candace Miller, and uh, also a senior member of the Homeland Security uh, Committee. Uh, the order of business, we'll, we'll start with opening statements. We have a panel of witnesses. We've got six witnesses today. Uh, someone from NASA, someone from, uh, from the United States Air Force, U.S. General Services Administration, Space Florida, the Audubon Society, and uh, the Port of uh, Port Canaveral. Uh, and we'll hear from those witnesses. Um, we'll go through all the witnesses, and then we will uh, have questions uh, from first members of the committee and then from uh, those who participated. Without objection, uh, Ms. Miller and Mr. Posey will be uh, accepted as participants in this hearing, even though they are not on the committee, and uh, also uh, entitled to question the witnesses and participate after the members of the committee uh, have completed their responsibilities. Without objection, so ordered. Uh, so that uh, is uh, sort of the opening rules of how we'll proceed today. Welcome everyone again and thank you for your accommodation. Um, we'll start with opening statements and I'll uh, give some remarks and a little bit of background and we'll yield to any other members that wish to uh, to submit to, uh, oral testimony or comments, opening statements today or uh, written statements for the record. So again, I uh, thank everyone for coming. I'm uh, pleased to be here. Uh, I'm particularly pleased that we have a, a fairly good representation from our members of Congress um, for field hearings. Sometimes it's hard to get members out. Although today's a beautiful day, uh, we'll have to go back and tell them what they missed uh, in Florida. Uh, so uh, thank you for coming and making the trip to uh, those from outside this area. And again, we're privileged to have two members who uh, represent this area almost, well, most specifically Mr. Posey and adjacent to uh, Mr. DeSantis. The reason though, that we've gathered here today is to uh, review NASA and the Air Force options uh, for dealing with uh, either vacant or underutilized buildings or facilities, uh, land, that may no, no longer be needed. Uh, the mission of NASA has dramatically changed in the last uh, few years, um, and we're, we're looking at more of uh, commercialization of the, the space activities that, that have traditionally been here uh, for the past uh, four decades. Uh, currently, NASA has 144,000 acres uh, many, and many facilities at uh, the Cape uh, Kennedy Center. Uh, in addition, that, uh, 
the Air Force has some 16,000 acres at the Canaveral Air Force Station. I think someone calculated today that's a, probably about 240 uh, square miles of space. It's a huge piece of real estate. And as the mission has changed, um, we find ourselves with, a, I believe, the inventory that was provided to the committee, with 720 buildings and structures on the NASA property. And the most recent uh, uh, information we've gotten from their data databases, 330 of those um, properties, buildings, uh, uh, or structures are uh, either unused or vacant. Yesterday we had a chance with the committee and some of the st uh, committee staff uh, to take a tour. Uh, we spent most of the la uh, latter part of the afternoon touring some specific sites. Uh, I asked earlier, and we started this review early last year, of some of the top uh, square footage of missing of a, a vacant or uh, properties that, uh, again, uh, are uh, close to totally being underutilized. This is what was provided to us. Um, that's uh, the tough news. The good news is actually since we got that inventory, we put a little check, uh, that little check mark, they've actually taken uh, one of those properties off the list. Um, our review, and I think the members will concur, of uh, the properties that we visited, and we, we uh, covered most of those there. Uh, and I'd like folks back to come for a historic trip, more of a tourist uh, uh, visit here, but uh, yesterday was business. But in looking at what um, is being done, I think I was fairly impressed with some of the progress that's been made to date, uh, and again, the efforts uh, to move forward we're dealing with, uh, again, a huge amount of in inventory. Uh, some time ago, we produced a report, uh, actually on the Transportation Committee, entitled, The Federal Government Must Stop Sitting on Its Assets. Uh, and to, uh, to uh, be a little uh, kind of cute title, but uh, also descriptive of something that we need to do. We're the largest property and land owners in the world and we have uh, billions and billions, probably trillion dollars worth of assets that are either idle and or underutilized. And having this in my own backyard, chairing formerly the Transportation Committee and now this Oversight Committee, uh, we want to make certain that even in our own backyard, in Mr. Posey's front yard and uh, Mr. DeSantis' front yard, that we are good stewards of the. Uh, the properties entrusted to us by the taxpayer. So uh, throughout my time in Congress, we uh, uh, most recently, we've tried to focus not only here but around the country. Some of you may have seen our success with the old post office of Washington, which is two blocks from the White House, sat vacant, part of it for 15 years, um, costing eight to $10 million a year. That will now be a 250 room hotel Instead of costing eight to ten million, it'll get a quarter of a million uh, revenue dollars of revenue every month, plus a cut of the profits. Uh, Mr. Trump's going to be developing that, but that's one of our success stories. We had a power uh, plant facility owned by the federal government, Georgetown, which uh, sat vacant for ten years, costing about two million dollars a year to maintain. Uh, that went up for sale. And, uh, sold for $19.5 million, again, stopping the bleeding and also uh, seeing some realization of that asset uh, for the taxpayers and as far as a return. Uh, so last year we began this uh, examination of NASA and also the Air Force property and their changing uh, mission and on this site. And uh, again, uh, I want to commend the leadership of both the the Air Force and NASA for some of the progress that's been made. But um, what we want to do today is really see where we're going for the future. Um, yesterday, the director told me, I think there were 18,000 people approximately that worked at the Cape. We're down to about uh, 8,000. 
And what we'd like to do is go from 8,000 on up, maybe we've hit bottom, but each of those buildings have the potential for, uh, again, specific utilization where you can, uh, in some cases, attract jobs, rent the property, uh, in some cases, long-term lease or even sell some of the property and uh, get a return, get to jobs back in the uh, community, back in the section of the state. So they've done some of that already and we'll hear uh, their story. Um, we also um, face the reality of a unique uh, property with uh, security protocols and concern both at NASA and uh, at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and they present uh, certain uh, challenges. I took, uh, uh, again, inventory of where we're going and uh, also have heard of, uh, of uh, desires by some in the community to expand some of the uh, natural areas. And we do have the National uh, Canaveral Seashore. We have uh, other areas that, where we have preserved and protected the environment. And uh, I, I invited uh, the Audubon Society representative to speak to us today about some of the thoughts that that uh, part of the, uh, our community and state and uh, again protecting national natural uh, treasures, what their interest would be uh, for the future. Unfortunately, uh, the process is slow. Some of the responsibility is Congress, some is the bureaucracy that we have to deal with. Uh, we're going to look at and hear from these folks too how uh, they have uh, tried to address moving forward again with a massive uh, evolution from sort of the government running everything to now a different uh, scenario. Um, we uh, unfortunately uh, are part of that, uh, that process in Congress. If necessary, needs to enact uh, laws. We'll see what changes we need to do, what suggestions we have. We can go back and make their uh, job easier in making this transition. So today we'll review what property and facilities are required for the current time and then we want to look into the future. You don't want to give away the store. You want to make certain that we're securing the assets we need for the federal government, for our space program, and also for preservation for the public as far as public lands are concerned. So uh, we will continue this, uh, this effort. Uh, this is the first uh, hearing we've held that's necessary. We'll hold some as a follow-up. Hearings in Washington as a follow-up with people that are not in these pan and panel here today, but people who do make those decisions. So uh, now we face a challenge of um, evolving our space program, what's taken place here in the past, yesterday. All of us who went on the tour sort of uh, went on a tour of the history of the space program from 1962 uh, uh, to uh, uh, just uh, days ago uh, when they had the most recent successes and launches from uh, uh, this area. But again, I think uh, our job is to uh, carefully review what's taken place uh, and uh, support viable options uh, to putting to use these valuable taxpayer assets as soon as possible. So I'd like to uh, welcome our witnesses. We'll get to them in a second. Let me first, uh, uh, we'll, we'll uh, do this, uh, Mr. DeSantis, member of the committee. Would you have any comment? I just wanted to uh, thank the chairman for, for taking the time to organize and set this up. Thanks to the Space Center for hosting us, and thank you for all the witnesses for taking the time uh, to come and testify about, uh, about an important issue, I think, in terms of how this property is disposed of to protect taxpayers, but also the potential uh, that we have uh, for some commercial um, opportunities, I think, is, is very important. So, so thanks to, again to the chairman. Mr. Patagoli. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I did want to say I noticed um, it's, uh, I propose that uh, two Michigan Congress members of Congress are here since so many Michiganders have moved here, or uh, I think you call them snowbirds, um, come down for the winter. Um, 
in Michigan, sometimes I've heard Florida referred to as Michigan's Southern Peninsula, uh, because so many of them uh, do come to uh, Florida during the winter months. And this year it was, it was a good choice because there's two and a half feet of snow, and I'm in the southern part of Michigan. So, but um, other than that, I want to thank the chairman for hosting this uh, hearing, as well as our witnesses. I really enjoyed the tour. Thank you very much. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, um, gentlemen from uh, our host district today, Mr. Posey. Uh, first, I want to thank you, Congressman Micah, for holding this hearing. And from a personal perspective, I want to thank you for including me on, my, on that oversight committee. Uh, but I, I appreciate uh, you including me in, in this. Uh, taxpayers want accountability, and the hearings that you have been holding uh, clearly are another great effort on your part and, and the part of Congress to try and provide better accountability. Uh, I hope you and members of the committee are, are pleased to learn how great uh, NASA at KSC and the Air Force over in the Cape side uh, are adapting to their new rules of facilitating our nation's space program in new ways. Uh, note, for example, the building you drove by yesterday, you saw where uh, they are now uh, building the Orion. Uh, two years ago, it would have been considered excessive and unneeded property. Uh, ultimately, it's a very valuable property and very important for this nation and for this area. Uh, I want to thank you all for keeping in mind that uh, the reason this 160,000 uh, plus acres was acquired and utilized and currently owned by the government is for our nation's program, our nation's space program. And uh, I'll keep it brief, Mr. Shimmer, and yield back. Thank you. Thank you again, and thank you for um, uh, participating. And uh, uh, no one watches over the space program more than, <laughs> than uh, Representative Posey. He has nonstop in our nation's capital. Um, and trying to make certain that we have every success possible here, and also a strong advocate for both uh, our military, the Air Force, and uh, NASA. Uh, pleased to yield on to the gentlelady from Michigan, uh, Ms. Miller. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairman. I certainly appreciate as well your calling this hearing today. I've been here at this uh, fantastic facility many times over my lifetime, but never in a hearing uh, situation, so I'm delighted to be here. And uh, when we think about the uh, incredibly rich heritage that the space program has given our country and the world, quite frankly. I think it's an unfortunate reality in some ways that we're here thinking about uh, the disposal of some of the facilities here rather than having the political will as a country to really buck up for the space program. And uh, that perhaps is an issue for another day. I know we have huge supporters of the space program here uh, today, but uh, that's not always the case in uh, the Capitol. Uh, there's uh, other uh, Obviously, with fiscal restraints, et cetera, there are other priorities, I suppose, but uh, when we think about what has happened in our world uh, and all of the positive spin-offs that have happened because of NASA, we can't put price on these kinds of things. We're just using the GPS on our way over here today. Not that we got lost, but you, you get, so you're using it, but it's a spin-off of what happened uh, with the fantastic uh, men and women that have served uh, in NASA. And so I'm just uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I think it will be a very interesting hearing as we are in the uh, uh, the mode of uh, trying to make sure that we get the best uh, uh, bang for the taxpayers' box, certainly. And uh, when I look at the distinguished uh, panels, uh, panelists that we have here today, in particular Mr. Cabana and uh, General uh, as well, uh, we certainly appreciate the service uh, that you have given to our country uh, and to the world, quite frankly. And uh, we're looking forward to hearing all of the testimony of the witnesses today. Thank you. Thank the uh, gentlelady. lady. Uh, first of all, we. Uh, I have a statement by Senator uh, Marco Rubio to uh, a request to be entered in the record. Uh, without objection, uh, his uh, statement will be entered in the record. Um, also, I'll entertain a motion that the uh, record be left open for a period of two weeks. Others who may wish to submit uh, uh, testimony, other members, uh, without objection, so ordered. So, uh, uh, do we have uh, any other representatives of uh, any other congressional offices? Just wanted to see. Okay. Didn't want to ignore them, but uh, uh, 
if they do come in, we'll introduce them. So with that, we'll turn to uh, our next order of business, is to hear from our six witnesses. Today we have six witnesses. First we have Mr. Robert uh, D. Cabana, and he is the director of the uh, JFK Space Center and, uh, um, uh, under NASA. We have Brigadier General uh, Nina uh, Ar Armano, and she is the commander of the 45th Space Space Wing, Director of the Eastern Range, Patrick Air Force Base, the United States Air Force. We have uh, John E.B. Smith, Regional Commissioner, Public Buildings uh, Service, uh, Southeast Sunbelt Region, U.S. Uh, General Services Administration. Mr. Jim uh, Kuzma, uh, Chief Operating Officer of uh, Space Florida. Mr. Charles Lee, Director of Advocacy of the Central Florida Policy Office of the uh, Florida Audubon Society. And then we have Mr. John Walsh, Chief Executive Officer of uh, Cape Canaveral Port Authority. Uh, this is uh, uh, an Investigations and Oversight Committee of Congress, and as such, we do swear in all of our witnesses. And ask our witnesses to please stand. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give before this subcommittee of Congress is the whole truth and nothing but the truth? Uh, let the record reflect that all of the witnesses answered in the affirmative, and again, we'll welcome each and every one of you. Thank you for uh, being with us and helping us with our uh, task today. Uh, first, uh, Again, uh, we'll, we'll go down the witnesses uh, in the order in which I introduced them. Mr. Robert Cabana, um, not only the director of the Kennedy Space Center, a great uh, tour guide and also a uh, great administrator, at least from what we learned of his uh, efforts uh, here uh, yesterday, and uh, also a distinguished uh, uh, astronaut himself. So uh, welcome, sir. Uh, what we're going to do is we try to limit you to five minutes. If you have additional information or uh, testimony you'd like to be made part of the official record of today's proceedings, just a request through the chair, and we'll do so. So uh, we'll go through each one and try to give you your five minutes. Uh, uh, welcome, and you are recognized, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, chair and Micah, members of the subcommittee, uh, thank you for this opportunity to appear today uh, to discuss NASA's management of its real property holdings here at the Kennedy Space Center as well as Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, I do have an official statement that I would like to so submit. That would actually be part of the record But I'd like to use this opportunity to uh, also uh, bring forth the key message that I have in that statement. KSC is well on its way to establishing itself as a multi-user spaceport that supports both government and commercial flights of both crew and cargo to and from the lower orbit and beyond. We've made great strides to become more efficient and cost effective, to divest of unneeded facilities, saving precious taxpayer dollars without diminishing our capabilities. We believe our story is an ongoing one of great success in transitioning this storied complex from 30 years of the space shuttle operations to the 21st launch century launch complex of the future. This would not have been possible without the support of our elected officials at both the state and federal level in the agreements that we have in place with our commercial partners. The Kennedy Space Center has had a glorious past, and we believe we have an even brighter future. And I look forward to your questions, sir. Very brief, but <laughs> we'll start with that. Now, she looks very young, but she's also a general. And uh, Armando uh, from the Air Force, and uh, she was also with us yesterday. I think we ruined everybody's Sunday here. But thank you again for your hospitality and uh, showing us the, uh, your area of responsibility. Uh, again, uh, uh, the uh, Patrick Air Force sec base section here uh, adjacent to the Space Center. Do you recognize? Mr. Chairman and distinguished members of today's hearing, it's my honor to be here representing Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and Patrick Air Force Base as the commander of the 45th Space Wing and the director of the Eastern Range. 
It's also my privilege to appear among my colleagues this morning to address the management of real property here at the world's premier gateway to space. Every day, our nation, and especially our military personnel, rely on vital space-based products launched just across the river from where we sit. The rich heritage, geographic advantages, and resident expertise of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and the entire Space Coast, for that matter, make it an attractive location for private sector customers. Many commercial companies not only want to operate at our site, but seek unused facilities to occupy. We give careful consideration to every request. We take our responsibility to manage our resources seriously by adhering to national space policies, public law, Department of Defense regulations, and Air Force guidelines. We lean forward to make excess or underutilized Eastern Range assets available when feasible. We understand many government approval processes are daunting, and we've attacked this issue over the past several years, attempting to balance the government's need for information and the need for timely responses that private entities depend on to be competitive. Our WING's front door process welcomes representation from commercial companies, DOD-sponsored contractors, educational institutions, and other private entities who are researching pro uh, possible operations at our location. Space Florida, who is here with us today, has been a valuable partner and instrumental in guiding some of these customers through those actions. We've worked with Space Florida to facilitate their investment in upfront environmental reviews, explosive sightings, Air Force Space Command, Space Operations Support Agreements, and real property licenses for two space launch complexes. We're also pursuing with Space Florida uh, licenses for additional facilities, which could be used to prepare launch vehicles for flight. This investment clears several time and financial obstacles for future commercial companies wishing to operate at those locations. I'm committed to working closely with our partners you see before you. The customers we're in contact with today and those to come in the future to ensure we continue to fully utilize the vital resources we've been entrusted with. Despite challenges brought on by our fiscal realities, my priorities remain 100% mission success, igniting innovation, and deliberately developing the outstanding men and women of Team Patrick King. I thank the committee for your steadfast support of the men and women of the 45th Space Wing and our Air Force and our space mission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. And now uh, back from a return engagement from the empty and vacant, I think we're going on six year dire courthouse in Miami. Um, we had two hearings there. But it's nice to see you, Mr. Smith. And not only will I have some questions about where we are, but where you've been, you're welcome and recognized, Mr. Smith. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Good morning, Chairman Micah and other distinguished members here today. My name is John Smith. I'm the Public Buildings Service Regional Commissioner for GSA's Southeast Sunbelt Region. Thank you for the opportunity to join you here today at Kennedy Space Center to discuss GSA's ongoing effort to assist NASA in the disposal of its unneeded real estate. As one of more than two dozen major federal land holding agencies, GSA manages only about 375 million of the nearly 3.3 billion square feet of space under the government's control. However, we have statutory authority to acquire, manage, utilize, and dispose of real property for most agencies. Within our own inventory, we have disposed of over 100 GSA managed properties nationwide, and we've received over $160 million in receipts for the Federal Buildings Fund since 2008, while avoiding more than $170 million in liability costs. Here in the Southeast Sunbelt region, we have disposed of eight buildings to avoid more than $47 million in future maintenance and repairs and generate approximately $17 million in sales. In addition to managing our own inventory, GSA is the primary real property disposal agent for the federal government. We work aggressively to identify and target unneeded assets 
for our partner federal agencies. TSA also provides strategic direction to agencies seeking to remove properties from their own inventories. We assist agencies by developing a tailored disposal strategy specific to an asset's characteristics, environmental laws, issues, community interest, market conditions, and other factors that influence repositioning of unneeded real estate. When preparing a property for public sale, GSA develops marketing plans that optimize public offering. We use tools and techniques designed to reach a very broad audience. When applicable, we target specific interests. While GSA has the expertise to navigate properties through the disposal process successfully, each individual landholding agency is responsible for making its own asset management decisions as to whether a property is access to its needs. In the last five years, GSA has disposed of 713 federal assets on behalf of GSA and other federal agencies. GSA conducted the majority of these disposal actions through public sales on realestatesales.gov, which provides a cost-effective way to reach a wide dissemination and develop of developmental interest and maximize the return for ta taxpayers. Most of these properties were not assets under GSA's jurisdiction, custody, or control. In Cape Canaveral, GSA is assisting NASA in developing asset management, utilization, and disposal strategies for unneeded facilities within the John F. Kennedy Space Center. Upon closure of the Space Shuttle program in 2011, NASA began exploring ways to balance the reduction of the agency's real estate footprint, operations and maintenance costs, while assuring that they retain facilities that may be needed in future missions. While NASA has its own landholding authorities and utilizes GSAs to dispose of real property. To that end, NASA has engaged GSA to help develop strategies for disposition at its facilities in this site. Thus far, GSA has provided appraisal and appraisal review services to assist with asset management planning for a wide variety and range of facilities here and at the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Additionally, we have received reports of excess for four facilities. Together, these facilities account for approximately 54,000 square feet of space. GSA is now reviewing NASA's report of excess and will begin the disposal process. Our next step is federal screening for each federal asset, for each asset. We understand that the Air Force may express interest in acquiring the properties. If NASA reports additional facilities as excess, we will assist in collecting due diligence and run the properties through the disposal process. If there is no expression of federal need for any of the facilities, GSA will conduct federal screenings for homeless on the McKinney-Vento and available public benefit conveyance programs, and depending on the outcome of that review, market the properties and identify potential buyers. GSA's Southeast Sunbelt region is pleased to assist with these efforts. We will continue to work with NASA and provide effective management and disposition of its unneeded real estate assets at Cape Canaveral and across the country. We look forward to working with this committee as this, can, this effort continues. On behalf of GSA's Public Building Service, the Southeast Sunbelt region, thank you for the opportunity to be here. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, and as I said, we'll uh, hold with all the questions. We'll hear from uh, Jim Kuzma, Chief Operating Officer of Space Florida. Welcome, and you're recognized, sir. Thank you, Chairman Mike and, Chair and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to discuss Florida's perspective regarding federal property that has supported the nation's space program, but now lies underutilized and not needed for NASA's mission. Thank you, Representative Posey of the House Space Subcommittee for your presence here today and your strong interest and past work in this area. In addressing this objective, I want to first acknowledge the efforts and progress of Kennedy Space Center to make, to, has made in the transition of unneeded property. I also want to acknowledge the positive efforts of the Air Force to transition unneeded assets in Cape Canaveral and their work to address processes and procedures valuable to the commercial industry. We commend their continuing efforts to optimize use of the, of the Eastern Range. There are some very good people doing their very best to navigate solutions to a very complex situation. But there is more to be done. Change is hard, but change is imperative to face an industry and global market pace, place that is rapidly evolving. We are focused on a long-term view that embraces and facilitates the spirit, agility, and business acumen of America's space industry entrepreneurs, not just a short-term transition. Cost-effective and reliable access to space is crucial for U.S. competitiveness. What to do with the unneeded assets at KSC is a matter of utmost importance to the future of U.S. competitiveness. The 140 acres that comprises the Kennedy Space Center was acquired by the government in the 1960s to support the nation's space program. 
federal assets that are not needed now to meet mission requirements are still vital to the U.S. space transportation system. Space Florida is the state's space board authority and focal point for business development and growth in the U.S. industry here in Florida. We have broad statutory authorities and a full range of capabilities that are being used to support our commercial company customers with our partners here at the Cape. Florida has been a leader in integrating space transportation into the fabric of our nation's transportation system. Our colleagues in Virginia, Alaska, and California have likewise demonstrated willingness to assume responsibility for elements of the U.S. space transportation development and operation. Congress has embraced a role for the states in helping promote and facilitate the nation's space transportation infrastructure and directed NASA to reduce our footprint to be consistent with defined missions and resources. In March, 13, in March 2013, Senator Rubio introduced a unanimously adopted sense of the Senate resolution that NASA should pursue opportunities such as expedited conveyance or transfer to a state or political subdivision on needed assets in order to promote commercial and scientific space activity. We are working with our colleagues at the Commercial Space Federation to offer suggestions for updates to the Commercial Space Launch Act that would enhance the effectiveness of state participation, streamline the transfer of unneeded federal property, and strengthen reporting requirements on efforts of various agencies to promote the country's space, commercial space industry. Through a combination of state funding and space force special district financing powers, Florida has provided more than $500 million to the transition of underutilized and, and unneeded property at both Kennedy Space Center and, Cape, and the Cape. Some notable investments are highlighted in my written testimony to the subcommittee. Space Board is now focused on the establishment of a space-facilitated, state-managed commercial space transportation capabilities to address the U.S. industry and the need for both vertical and horizontal facilities that can effectively compete internationally. The two components of this initiative are the proposed Shiloh Launch Complex, which will be located at, the, at KSC's northern boundary, and the formal shuttle landing facility. The state's vision for both is a commercial operation by Space Florida and its partners under FAA Spaceport Licensing and Regulatory Authority. It's Space Florida's goal to provide a vertical launch site option to the commercial launch providers on land which is not under the jurisdiction of a federal installation or federal rank. The need for such an option by the industry has been articulated by U.S. companies such as SpaceX, which is investigating alternative sites in Texas, Georgia, and elsewhere, in addition to ours here in Florida. Further, we believe that our proposed use is compatible with the long-standing conservation uses that have been established through NASA's management agreement with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Park Service. With regards to the shuttle landing facility, we have shared with NASA a number of specific concepts and approaches we believe are crucial to achieve a sustainable business model and compatible operations with ongoing federal activities. I will highlight a few points critical of critical importance to the state to define the mutually benef beneficial partnership. Space Florida needs the freedom to manage and operate the facility in accordance with FAA standards. We propose to fully conform to other applicable federal laws and regulations, but ask that the jurisdiction and laws of Florida apply. As responsible stewards of Florida's taxpayer resources, we seek a reasonable opportunity to achieve a self sustainable, self supporting business model that allows us to effectively compete and competitively service the specialized users we seek to attract. Other states and nations are vying for this industry, and Florida hopes, hopes not to be disadvantaged by the location of a spaceport on a site of federally owned land. Florida needs clear rights to develop, improve, and sustain infrastructure, doing so in an environmentally responsible way for as long as the state may need the capability to support the industry and its users. There should be an opportunity for return on investment and security in the long-term opportunity for sustained operations. The capability of the commercial launch providers to operate independently from a federal installation or range at sites where they are in control of their own fate in meeting scheduled commitments to their customers is paramount to their ability to compete in the marketplace. We agree with NASA's IG that the agency's culture and business practices have been a significant impediment. The overarching strategy for the future is sometimes confused. Every agreement with a new facility is begun with a separate and unique transaction with different goals and outcomes. This results in confusing and complex contract development and management. The Inspector General also defined, identified a keep it in case you need it approach as among the agency's response to certain uncertain requirements and a NASA culture of governance structure that has blurred lines of authority 
and limiting NASA's ability to assess infrastructure needs from an overarching agency perspective. We believe that the best success and best practices in disposal of unneeded federal property can be found in the base realignment and enclosure process and other transfers of former def defense facilities such as air airports and seaports. A model that looked past short-term revenue generation options to a transition and divestiture of unneeded property, unneeded and un underutilized property and its liability from the property list of the services without tails and clawbacks. The model also provided DOD with tools allowing them to respond as a partner where the future of a community was adversely impacted by government decision. GSA has also delegated transfer authority in some of, in some of these through a public benefit conveyance process to place important transportation aspects in the hands of a state or local entity. Some great examples may be found in California's Mojave Spaceport and Civilian Aerospace Test Center, Cecil Spaceport in Jacksonville, and the Ellington Field Airport in Houston. All have been success stories economically. Florida is committed to working with the federal government to seek ways to both reduce the federal property liability and improve utilization of the land for its intended purpose. This can be done without compromising the overall balance of land uses with sustained stewardship of the environment and without compromising NASA's ability to perform current or future missions. I thank you again for requesting a Florida perspective on, a, on the matter we're discussing today. I look forward to continuing to be a resource to the committee, your staff, and the Florida de delegation whenever needed. I am pleased to answer any questions. You thank have. you, and uh, we'll, we'll get to questions shortly. Mr. Charles Lee of the Florida Audubon Society. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to present this testimony today. You're not picking up, uh, Charles, but maybe a little bit closer. Maybe now? Yeah, that's okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to present this uh, testimony today, members of the committee. Uh, I have written testimony that uh, I would uh, like Without to ask. Without objection, and the next part of the record, proceed. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, I've been involved as an employee of Audubon now for 41 years. Audubon's our state's oldest and largest environmental organization, having been formed uh, in March of 1900 almost 114 years ago. During that span of time, a great part of our effort has been directed toward the conservation of the coastal resources associated with what we now know as the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge and Canaveral National Seashore. The 140,000 acre Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge exists almost entirely upon lands that are owned by NASA. In 1963, Fish and Wildlife Service and Department of Interior entered into a cooperative interagency agreement establishing the refuge. Today, the refuge is home to over a thousand species of plants, 500 species of birds, fish, and wildlife, some 66 of which are listed by federal and state governments as endangered, threatened, or otherwise in peril. Perhaps more significantly, in 2012, 1.2 million people visited the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. It is one of the most popular wildlife viewing sites in the United States and the premier viewing site on the east coast of the United States. In addition, over 215,000 sports fishermen utilize the waters of Mosquito Lagoon. Those visits generated in excess of $60 million of economic activity in Volusia and Brevard counties. I'm here today to present two recommendations to you, and these recommendations come out of the fact that the basis for the continued existence of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge is fragile. NASA can withdraw land from the refuge at any time and could turn it over to private interests or public interests for development purposes. In comparison to that, in 1975, through the enactment of 93-626 public law, the Congress of the United States recognized it was necessary to give Canaveral National Seashore the stability of primary control over the land within the National Seashore. Our first recommendation to you is that with regard to the land north of State Road 402, which is the access road to Canaveral National Seashore, 
We believe that the time has come to move that land permanently into the ownership of the Department of Interior, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. It's significant uh, to recognize uh, that these are the lands that are utilized by those 1.2 million people. In 2012, after looking at the question of whether private industry space launch facilities should be located in the northern area north of State Route 402, a study that was conducted by NASA in 2008. In 2012, the Kennedy Space Center uh, was adopted a long-term management plan known as Kennedy Space Center Future Development Concept 2012 to, 24, to, to 2031. This divided the natural areas within the Kennedy Space Center into two zones. Operational Buffer 1, north of State Road 402, and Operational Buffer 2, south of State Road 402. We believe that with regard to Operational Buffer 1, it is time to seriously consider moving those lands into the ownership of the Department of Interior, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. With regard to Operational Buffer 2, we suggest that NASA and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service be directed to review the status of the larger blocks of those lands to determine which portions of this land, if any, are appropriate for ownership transfers to the Fish and Wildlife Service. The second recommendation goes to some questions you may have heard discussed by the gentleman from Space Florida. We believe that it is very important that with regard to those 330 vacant buildings, Mr. Chairman, that you mentioned, and with regard to many thousands of acres of either developed or undeveloped land that could be developed in an environmentally desirable way for private space industry use, south of State Road 402, which would not interrupt the public use of the National Wildlife Refuge. We believe that a maximum effort needs to be made to repurpose those properties for use by the private space industry and for use by space Florida. We would point out that in the recent controversial proposal of Space Florida to cut land out of the National Wildlife Refuge and potentially close access to those several million visitors that are coming, that the reason given by Space Florida to move 10 miles north of NASA's launch compound is a claim that they can't work with NASA, is a claim that they can't work within NASA's security regulations or within the combined launch schedules of the Air Force or NASA. We think, Mr. Chairman, that it is Congress's role to make sure that the bureaucracy does not require private space industry to be forced into the pristine areas of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge because they cannot align their regulations and lot schedules with the need of the private space industry. Now, we regard the claims of Space Florida with some skepticism. And the reason for our skepticism is that we and the rest of the world know that as Space Florida is making those claims and is trying to stake out its private area in the northern area of the National Wildlife Refuge. Space companies such as SpaceX are moving quickly to try to reach their own agreements with NASA south of State Road 402. So we're frankly, in all candor, not sure how legitimate the issue is. But if, in fact, it is the case that Space Florida is being forced to locate 10 miles north of State Road 402 in the heart of the refuge because of the policies of NASA and the Air Force. We believe that with regard to those policies, the better course of action in the interest of those 1.2 million visitors is for Congress to move quickly to make sure that the red tape is sliced through and that an area perhaps owned, perhaps to be owned by Space Florida, perhaps as the gentleman from Space Florida said, entirely under their ownership, be granted to them south of State Road 402 where the space industry could flourish and where 
there would no longer be the threat of any rough inter interruption to the visitors that utilize uh, the area of the Northern Wildlife Refuge. The final, th final thing that I'll say. I'll give you three extra minutes, but just wrap it up real, real quickly, okay. and we'll have a chance during questions. Right. I just wanted to conclude, conclude by saying that the northern end of the refuge north of State Route 402 has been spared uh, most of the public closures because of the good planning of NASA to place everything south of 402. The launch traje trajectories don't go over the refuge and the seashore, and State Route 402 was relocated north to actually make sure that when the shuttle program was going, there would not be uh, long-term closures of, of Canaveral National Seashore. And so we think very clearly NASA's plan from 2012 is the way to go. Following that plan, inserting the private space industry south of State Route 402, and we support that. Thank, Thank you, Mr. And uh, now we'll hear from our final witness, uh, Mr. John Mullich, uh, CEO of uh, Cape Canaveral Port Authority. Welcome, and you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the hearing today. Canaveral Port Authority is an independent port authority chartered and authorized in the state of Florida. CPA is now the second busiest cruise port in the world. Over four million cruise passenger movements take place annually with plans to double this by mid-2020s. In 2012, the port aggressively proceeded with cargo expansion with two new piers and over 80 acre container backup terminal region to expand trade and cargo badly needed in the Central Florida. Over $70 million has been invested in these two deep water bursts, with two ship to shore post Panamax cranes arriving this March. Eventually, another $150 million will be invested by both the port and private terminal operators. The port today has total direct and indirect jobs from the port activity that now exceeds 17,000. CPA currently has a $3.5 billion net economic impact to the region each and every year. Direct rail service is a critical component for a dynamic and vibrant cargo business in Port Canaveral. The Florida East Coast Railroad, which serves the east coast of the Florida Peninsula, is situated west of Route 1. In 2012, CPA began discussions with Kennedy Space Center planners to explore rail connections to the port. CPA looked at working with Kennedy Space Center planners, the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station planners, and eventually five routes were put into place. But by process of elimination, the route utilizing the upper JJ Bridge, maintaining service through Kennedy Space Center, has appeared as the preferred route and option. A phase two study has been completed with positive results and lead to the need for agreements with Kennedy Space Center for an EIS with a federal sponsor separate from Kennedy Space Center. KSC would remain a cooperating agency in this EIS. CPA is now working with MARAD, the Maritime Administration, as its EIS federal sponsor. CPA and Kennedy Space Center staff are currently also working on a space agreement to perform added testing, such as vibration impact analysis, so that the rails do not have a negative impact on the prime operations of the base. CPA appreciates the open and willing efforts of NASA staff and leadership to work with CPA on a proposed rail asset transfer and operating agreements. This would be a classic 3P initiative to reduce NASA's operating cost and not having to go it alone on rail, and the port can have rail service badly needed to create jobs, growth, and regional economic development. This project still has many hurdles. And the process to go through the EIS will be able to allow all needed agencies and stakeholders to understand how this rail can be built safely and continue with care for our environment. The port has always made the environment one of our key priorities. CPA has a limited amount of land available today for growth. One request of CPA is that the submerged lands north of the port need a mutual review with NASA as there is a 1963 agreement and a 1964 agreement that have a 100 acre overlap to each other. CPA has also reached out to the United States Air Force with an unsolicited offer from CPA to lease Air Force lands adjacent to and north of the Middle Basin. This offer was issued to General Manio, 
and after review with Space Command, has been submitted to the U.S. Air Force Civil Engineering Unit in Texas for an EUL review. We appreciate the General's open-mindedness to explore these concepts through the established EOU, ELU process and procedures. In closing, we appreciate the Congressional hearing today as a way CPA can work openly and transparently to continue communication with our two federal partners in Brevard County to expedite these critical initiatives. We can create 5,000 living wage jobs in the Port Region over the next five to seven years, and at least 10,000 additional jobs over the next 10 to 15 years working with private infrastructure industries. Our mission is to lift up our community, creating high quality jobs in diverse industries, good logistics, and leads to good manufacturing. This community and the region need the stakeholders of this hearing to pledge working diligently together so our community can proudly support their families with thousands of former workers back to work again. Nothing replaces the feeling of a hand up and a job instead of a handout. Our area is filled with blight and economic ravage from the downturn of the space programs. We can do better. We can diversify our region. We can supply a growing state with goods and services it needs right here from East Central Florida. This rail and land discussed today can allow CPA to do our part to put those 10 to 15,000 people to work. If we can send a rover to Mars, surely we can connect 10 miles of railroad in a technology that's been done since the 1800s. We believe this is doable and we share in the responsibility to make it happen. I believe we can redefine our future now, and as new industries grow from this port into our industrial parks, we need to have strong infrastructure to link ourselves to the world economy. Strong communities and economies grow out of strong and dynamic ports, airports and seaports, as well as spaceports. This seaport can be the backbone and driver of your continued help. We truly appreciate the start of this process, as Mr. Bob Cabana, General Nino Romano, as well as the respective staffs. We know we can bring this mission to a success. <coughs> thank you, Member of the Committee. Well, thank you, and I thank all of the witnesses, and we'll uh, launch right into questions. Uh, first of all, um, Director Cabana and then um, uh, General Romano, um, both in charge locally. With this, with carrying out the mission, and Congress has uh, set in an act, of, I guess the Authorization Act you all did in 2010 for uh, NASA. That, uh, we move forward with right sizing this, the, these operations, both the, uh, the, the uh, NASA and also the Air Force of the property here. Um, we heard. Um, I heard an interesting testimony today uh, from Space Florida, uh, Jim Kuzma said uh, there's sometimes uh, blurred lines. Uh, I know you're both trying to do the best on the ground here. Can you give us a candid assessment of any impediments or anything you think we could do to speed up the process? We've also heard from uh, GSA. Now, GSA told me, uh, Mr. Smith told us, uh, he has 54,000 square feet uh, that has been turned over to him uh, and uh, uh, determined as excess. That's, that's not a lot, um, uh, considering all the property and space that we have here. So I uh, want to know two things. One. Uh, how can we speed this process up? What tools do you need to uh, have us move forward? And if there are blurred lines, how do we, uh, what lines need to be cleared up? So first we'll hear from the director and then the general. Um, can you tell us, uh, uh, again, your candid assessment of how we get things moving even faster? Well, Mr. Chairman, I don't believe there are blurred lines. I think it's very clear uh, how we're dealing with our property. Uh, we did an intensive study uh, post-shuttle to determine what facilities we needed for our future programs, our exploration programs. Uh, Is that the 2012 study? 
It was, and uh, we have our, there's there's two things. First off, uh, the uh, teacher development concept that was mentioned, that is complete. It's been reviewed by headquarters and approved. Uh, we have our new master plan up at headquarters now, and we're waiting for a final approval of that so that we can release it. But uh, we did a, a study within the program also, the exploration program, ground systems development, and uh, SLS, Space Launch System, determine what we actually needed facilities-wise. And we are divesting ourselves of those we don't need. We took a close look at which ones we could convert to uh, uh, commercial use, which would be given to other uh, federal agencies, specifically the Air Force is interested in some at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, and uh, also uh, some facilities on the Kennedy side. So do you, then you say you have, a, first of all, you've got enough we have a plan. Plans and we're in place. Place. You're executing it, and you don't see any delay in time or authority. It has been, well, there are numerous authorities that we use to transfer these facilities. Right. We have the enhanced use lease, space act agreements, use permits, uh, commercial space launch agreements, and uh, concessionaire agreements. And but you have all, those would all be tools that you can execute. I believe we have. So we've got this little list up here. So, and since we started this about a year ago, we now have a check off on on one of these top six pro uh, properties in listed space. On those properties, we're using the one that's checked, and all the others are slated for demolition. So we uh, we have a plan. Okay. So uh, again, um, there's no potential use. Nothing's going to be no, transferred. Sir, to there was no interest. We went out to the industry and uh, went out and asked for anybody that was interested in any of the vacant facilities. They're, they're not interested, so our option. Now, you did point out yesterday in one of your demolitions, you were able to recoup a certain amount of uh, money from materials and all. That sounded uh, beneficial to the taxpayers. But uh, again, uh, we're, we're trying to see what the, the long-term plan is. And uh, I have a whole bunch of different reports, 300, uh, they're not all buildings, some are small structures, some are launch pads and other things that aren't easily uh, transferred to another use. So you feel you have enough authority and uh, to, to, to move forward on an expedited basis? Well, as quickly as we can within the system, sir. Part of the problem is, you know, a lot of this hadn't been done before. And each one of these agreements that we enter into is unique to the facility and the customer that's taking it over. Right. So we use it's it. Not, it isn't a, just a typical situation, and you're in a secure area here uh, that uh, is somewhat unique. Yes, sir. Again, the broad nature of the property. We also retain ownership of the land underneath. Right. And that, it, and that would be your intent for all of the land, or yes, are you looking at disposing of any? No, sir. We're looking to keep all the land. As a buffer zone and, and as part of our secure area, uh, we've also the land that the port's interested in, Mr. Uh, Walsh. Is that uh, Air Force or is that uh, NASA? Uh, the land lease is Air Force. Air Force. Okay. Well, let, let me hear from the general then. Um, now, um, do you have the authority? Are you able to move forward? And then, uh, what what have you done uh, to again comply with the? terms of what Congress passed it, it both authorization and also um, in a recent sense of Congress uh, that was passed in the budget. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your question. Uh, I think this hearing has been a great opportunity to get the word out that the space mission is very much alive and well here at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Uh, as the Air Force has flown out old capabilities such as Titan and Atlas, we have replaced old capability with new. Um, I believe I have the tools. I agree with Mr. Cabana when we don't have blurred lines and there are no impediments to uh, the actions we need to take. Um, we have the tools that we need. I know on the Air Force side of the 16,000 acres on Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, there's roughly 1,600 facilities. We do a quarterly review. We lean forward. Uh, we have a robust accountability process. We have three choices with our property. We either uh, continue to use the buildings uh, with the viable missions that are there. Uh, we can lease to new partners, or we have a very small amount that is currently vacant, about 11% of our property is vacant, and that equates to about eight facilities that we're looking uh, to new customers. What about the 
We heard Mr. Walsh that he has a proposal before uh, Air Force. Uh, uh, how long will that take to uh, process? Sir, we received uh, Mr. Walsh's proposal in January, and it is an incremental proposal. It begins with about 20 acres of land that they're looking at on our on our port side, which is the very south end of Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And uh, they're, they're looking to uh, expand their cargo operations at an area of, of uh, the Cape that could be potentially dual use. We, we, the Air Force, use that port property to bring in our, our large boosters and, and other launch vehicle equipment. Uh, we uh, also know that the Army has some staging area down there, and of course the Navy uses the southern area of our port. So uh, we have, uh, I've briefed my chain of command, and we have uh, taken this uh, proposal and given it to the Air Force Civil Engineer Center for them to do an operation. What do you think of that uh, when we hear something back? So we're hoping to hear something back in the next few months. We're hoping six months. And uh, we'll be very anxious to receive yeah. that assessment. Then we've had the proposal. Mr. Posey and I made an attempt a couple of years ago with your predecessor to look at the option, uh, the uh, possibility of getting rail into the port. The port's a huge economic generator. I don't know how many hundreds of additional jobs we could have through this expansion, but um, uh, we were just turned down flat. And we want to tell you that you're a breath of fresh air from the West Coast. I guess you came from Vandenberg where they had actually uh, had some activity, where they had a rail line. We looked at that yesterday, and it doesn't seem like a, you know, um, something that can't be accomplished with people working together, both to benefit this, uh, the director here. We, we looked at the line coming in, and they do, they do deliver, I guess, the uh, solid rocket, rocket to, uh, uh, what do they call them? Boosters from Utah they produce, uh, and they end up, uh, we, we went to the site where they are uh, delivered, and the line looked like it was pretty good shape. So it's something I think that we would like to see um, uh, everyone work on, because again, this is about jobs, this is about expanding the economy. Not to mention, there might be some revenue for the Air Force. I didn't ask uh, Mr. Cabana, how much money are you getting on any lease? Incidentally, he didn't do a good job telling you all the things he's done, but we did look at like a 39A and B uh, and his uh, transformation of some of that, uh, uh, which part of it's used by uh, SpaceX, I guess. If I could, sir, we have 53 agreements in place right now in Warren work. Okay, you got to toot your horn to that. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I, but it's, it's pretty, pretty it's great, it's great, yeah, but uh, they, you know, these guys didn't catch no, up. But if, right. I, if I could, I mean, we've recently uh, selected SpaceX to take over operations of Pad 39A. Uh, they're going to move in there. We should be uh, closing that agreement with them here in the next few weeks or so. Uh, we have uh, we're the huge space vehicle space. assembly building. Uh, he is, con has, is converting, I guess, into dual uses. Well, one, one day we're going to use for our space launch system, and we're looking at High Bay 1, offering that to a commercial company along with uh, mobile launch platforms. That announcement still has to go out. We're working through the process on that. With the orbit processing facilities we found users for, all the major, the really high dollar value items that will enable commercial space operations, we are moving forward. Uh, as, uh, uh, John have you got any amount of uh, lease money coming in? We uh, do have uh, some money coming in, and uh, well, I don't have the numbers for you. I can get that. If you could but provide that to the committee, we'd just like to see what, what what you are getting in sure. from what, in, the, what you're turning around. In some cases, they're paying just direct costs because it's right. through commercial space launch agreements where it enables commercial space operations, but we're not making money. But uh, the real benefit here is that we're not paying money to maintain these facilities. They've been taken off the taxpayer rolls, right. saving us precious dollars in our operating uh, expenses while enabling commercial space operations at the same and time. With site for the record, what your uh, operations you were giving us that yesterday was 300 million to our 360, 300 million. Well, that, that was in, in 2013, what we initially went in with for a cost around the center was in the ballpark of 370 million. By the time we got uh, the budget and the sequestration and all the cuts were made, we were down to 320 some million. So uh, we're managing to live within that. But in order to do that, we have to become more efficient and cost effective. And, and we're doing that. Okay. Um, well, I'd also um, like to add, if I could, you know, when we were talking about, um, you know, being more 
commercial friendly. You know, we don't think that we're onerous in bringing commercial operators in. Our goal is to make them as autonomous as possible. Uh, by way of example, uh, I asked our safety and mission assurance folks to look at what are the requirements to operate at KSC. And we have three models. We have purely NASA operations, joint use operations, and purely commercial operations. Uh, during shuttle and our safety documentation, there were 2,200 shell statements, requirements that had to be met. Uh, we went through that and scrubbed out what are requirements, what are best practices, and are there other ways to meet these requirements. And we don't have to tell a commercial customer that he has to meet OSHA requirements, that he has to meet environmental requirements. Uh, that's the law that they have to meet those. So we've gotten those 2,200 down to uh, you know, 55 shell statements in our safety documentation. Uh, we're working with the range to figure out ways uh, to launch in a more friendly manner, if you will. Uh, customers have to meet uh, commercial space uh, requirements, get an FAA license in order to launch. Those requirements are the same as the range requirements. So we're working to make commercial operations at KSC uh, as user-friendly as possible and as autonomous as possible. Thank you, uh, Mr. DeSantis. Jim Kuzma, can you give the committee uh, an update on Space Florida's bid to construct a uh, launch facility complex at Shiloh? Uh, sir, uh, uh, thanks uh, for a good chance. Uh, uh, currently, where we're at is that the, uh, uh, the center director uh, uh, approved that the environmental impact statement that is needed for the actual license uh, would fall under the jurisdiction, jurisdiction of the FAA Office of Space Transportation. Uh, actually, tomorrow and, uh, and Wednesday, the uh, scoping meeting for the environmental impact statement right, um, are, are being held both at New Smyrna High School and at the uh, Eastern Florida State College Titusville campus. It's there that uh, the public will have the opportunity to identify the issues and actually discuss a lot of the issues and alternatives that, that uh, Mr. Lee spoke of at that time. Uh, at the same time, we are pursuing the other, the other facets of the license licensing uh, requirement to be a site operator, and uh, we'll continue to do so, sir. We expect that the uh, environment that the draft will be ready in approximately July of 2015, which actually is aligned to one of our commercial customers uh, looking at that as an option for their launch site. Thank you, sir. And uh, what about Shiloh? Why did Space Florida choose uh, that particular location? Sir, uh, uh, to be quite, quite honest with you, it was in response to uh, uh, SpaceX looking at Texas as a, a launch site uh, moving away from the Cape. We did an exhaustive search up and down the east coast of Florida, five different sites, um, and actually there were, there were the site selected was actually Launch Complex 36. It was presented to SpaceX. Uh, it was there at that time that uh, we were informed by uh, the leadership at, at SpaceX that uh, they would not look to a, a government range for, to host their commercial, their commercial activities. Um, they would do some from the, the Cape, and they're continuing to do that. Um, but for a long term, looking at a number of launches, they would look for another site that they could have that environment. Um, I think one of the things that we pointed out is that Space Florida's mission is sometimes in tension with both NASA and the 45th. Our job is to grow the industry and be responsive. And uh, in that case, you know, the industry market, the, the leaders, and the, not only launch providers, but the, their payload providers, are looking for some of those assurances. Uh, we're looking to create that environment that they would have in Texas, and that's how we moved up toward uh, Shiloh, which had been identified as a, a uh, optimum site on two other occasions. In, in terms of the uh, private uh, entities that were uh, looking at commercial launch, why do they uh, not want to use existing facilities? Why would something like Shiloh be more attractive to them? Sir, a lot of the uh, entrepreneurs, uh, if you will, uh, they like to be in control of their own destiny. Right. Uh, unfortunately, in the past, there's been occasions where a payload not being ready just from a throughput uh, process uh, specific came a long time ago. It's a, one of uh, the rockets sat in the building and prevented any other activity. So that's actually, you can, see, you can relate that to when a lot of the commercial industries started going overseas for that. Um, there's been different act activities. Uh, the discussion of security is, is a big one with regard to national security. So when those come in, uh, a lot of the customers have foreign customers. There's some challenges in getting there, and quite honestly, uh, during 9-11 and even in the most recent uh, uh, government shutdown, uh, a lot of those folks were, were not pro permitted to go, not on the, necessarily the uh, Air Force side, but on the Cape side. So 
it, it's, a, it's a lot of different things that they look, um, but it's really that uh, a lot of them are looking to specifically, um, you know, optimize their opportunities. You have to realize too that they, uh, they generate revenue by meeting timelines and they pay fines if they don't meet their contractual form. You mentioned sometimes there, there could be a tension between Space Board and NASA. So how, uh, with this whole issue with Shiloh, how is NASA uh, responding to, to the I'd like to couch that as attention is really in the objectives, not in the relationship. No, I understand that, absolutely. Uh, 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 I think uh, there's lots of discussion early on, right? Uh, but quite honestly, Director Kermani has been very supportive in us pursuing the environmental impact statement. Uh, we have not, you know, there are some options as to how the property, what kind of property transfer ownership would be there, but uh, quite honestly, we decided that we needed to push through whether or not it was a viable location Right, and address those in, in, during the actual process. And I think that's a, a very prudent way to approach it. So you, uh, so, so you anticipate uh, kind of future negotiations with NASA? You, you think that those are likely to be, uh, be productive? Yes, sir. Did you want to? Want to add? I could, sir. Yes. Uh, NASA is neutral on this. As an owner of the property, we are a participating agency in the environmental impact statement. The environmental impact statement is being led by the uh, FAA. And uh, if at some point there's a positive environmental impact statement and there is a business case that would justify it, then NASA would consider entering into negotiations. Very good. Um, and so uh, just one more question on this uh, uh, for Mr. Kuzma. Um, uh, what benefits does Space Board see to the community and taxpayers um, out of uh, commercial uh, space flight development in the city in this region? Sir, I, I don't uh, actually have the number to come back with an economic study to do that, but, uh, but certainly if you look at what uh, we, before we enter any agreement, we look at both the uh, number of jobs and actually the capital investment. So um, we're looking at, uh, at close to, for most of the time, between 150 and 200, 250 jobs per the commercial company. If you look at SpaceX, it's where they're going to be. And you look at an investment from that company of somewhere between 60 to $120 million. Very well. Well, thanks to thank the witnesses. I've really enjoyed uh, listening to you, and I yield back. <coughs> Mr. Ben Lillian. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, in 2013, in a 2013 review that NASA Inspector General reported that since 2005, the agency's operations and maintenance costs have increased by 173 million, or 44 percent. As so. Uh, 2010, NASA had over 2.6 billion in annual deferred maintenance costs. According to the Inspector General, in 2013, NASA continues to retain real property that is underutilized, does not have identified future mission uses, or is duplicative of other assets in its real property inventory. In 2012, an internal agency-wide NASA review estimated that the agency may have as many as 865 unneeded, or I heard 720 now with that, uh, facilities with maintenance costs of over 24 million annually. Uh, Mr. Cabana, uh, according to NASA Inspector General, NASA's operations maintenance costs have increased by 45, 44% since 2025. 20, what is the cause of any rising costs you see here at the Kennedy? So at KSC, uh, I should say that we took it very seriously, what's in that report. And we're looking very closely, again, at what facilities we need, and we are divesting ourselves of those that we do not need. Uh, obviously, with an aging infrastructure, uh, maintenance costs continue to rise over time, and we're constantly uh, repairing uh, water lines and so on uh, as we upgrade. In many cases, it makes much more sense to uh, demolish an old facility and build something new. Uh, for example, our new Propellants North facility is a Leeds Platinum facility. It actually generates more electricity than it uses. It puts energy on the grid, and we get our electricity for free at night in that facility. So uh, that's what we're doing. We're identifying the facilities that we need and getting rid of those that we don't, and uh, trying to be very efficient in how we do it. Uh, the chairman asked earlier how much rent we were getting. Uh, and again, this isn't profit. It, it covers uh, you know, the direct cost of those facilities also, but uh, with our current agreements, we have $580,000 a year coming in in rent on those facilities. Uh, again, that covers our costs to help provide uh, 
the, the services that we have to those facilities also. But it, again, it takes them off our rules where we're not paying those maintenance costs. So, so we'll now, um, I'm, I'm doing understanding this uh, bureaucratic process. Maybe you can help me here. When you identify a building or buildings that are going to be mock abandoned, or disposed, they go to the GSA, correct? You would notify the GSA? It, it depends. It, only if we were going to sell it or if we were going to transfer it to another uh, agency. And we're not actually selling the buildings. Uh, we're keeping them in either getting a use agreement for them, an enhanced use of these space tag agreement, and they have to be something that would help enable commercial operations, space operations, if you can. Right. Part of our mission. I, what, I, what I'm trying to get to is what's the process, the time? Frame it takes like uh, you have to notify GSA. Do I understand this correctly? That you're going to put this uh, building up for rent or make it available to private enterprise that uh, must meet certain uh, requirements that you set, right? So how long does it take for uh, before you come to the conclusion that nobody's interested and it's time to demolish the building? I think it depends on the, the facility and. Uh, it, the studies that are being done, I'd have to defer to the superintendent from the GSA how long it takes to uh, get through the process. Mr. Smith, he just he notifies you that this building, we'd like to put this building up for sale or lease, or well, for lease. And, um, you know, what's your process to advertise? And but, but, sir, I should add, we, we're not going through the GSA to lease our buildings. Okay. We're utilizing the GSA to transfer between federal agencies. So those facilities at Cape Canaveral Air Force Station that are NASA facilities, my goal is to remove ourselves as much as possible from Cape Canaveral Air Force Station and just have NASA facilities at Kennedy uh, Space Center. So, so have, those facilities that we're transferring, we have to do that through the GSA. So you have a limited uh, market to lease these buildings. Yes, sir. How long does that take uh, to see if anybody's interested? And, when, and if not, uh, when, when you determine that it's going to be demolished, you know, what's that process? How, what's the time frame? It could take, you know, as long as a, a year. It depends. Again, if we're going to demolish a facility, we have to have the funds to do that. So we have to work through NASA headquarters and our budget process in order for uh, construction of facilities and facilities. Okay, so you, you don't have a customer, now you want to demolish the building. What, what's, if we did, if I identified it now, it would get list, put in the list of priorities uh, at NASA as to what facilities where had the highest priority for the funds that were available in that budget year to provide it. So it may be next year, it may be the year after that. In the meantime, if it we're not able to be demolished right away, it would be abandoned. It would be put in a safe state where we're not investing money uh, to maintain it, knowing that it's going to be demolished. Thank you very much. Uh, with that. Chairman, I that. Thank you. Um. Elapsed or what have you, but I think uh, turning property over, or actually accessing property to the Department of Interior has been suggested by one of our, some testimony this morning, I think is uh, totally something else because uh, I think that could be uh, very short-sighted uh, by, the, uh, by uh, the nation. I think that um, optimally, the space program uh, will begin uh, uh, really ratcheting back up at some point. I mean, there's always an ebb and flow to these kinds of things. There's an ebb and flow uh, to the economics, et cetera. And the space program, in my mind, needs to be, uh, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, the Congress uh, uh, needs to think about uh, ratcheting it up, uh, rubbing it up uh, a bit more. And it's not just some um, romantic concept, uh, the space program. It is a critical component of our nation's ability to be uh, positioned globally uh, in the economic <coughs> footprint when we think about STEM and some of the other kinds of things that, uh, that have to be happening in our educational system. So I, uh, I would say this, as, as we had an opportunity yesterday to tour, um, one of the things I heard from uh, General uh, Romano as well as uh, in particular Mr. Cabana was about the uh, partnerships. That seemed to be sort of an operative phrase uh, throughout the tour. Uh, partnerships uh, with uh, some of your commercial ventures, et cetera. But I think as we uh, face the challenges, really, um, of uh, utilizing the real estate here, obviously, uh, one of the uh, uh, priority issues must be security and how you can secure. 
uh, the, the, all of your facilities here and make sure you're protecting the taxpayers' uh, assets, et cetera, et cetera. But as has also been uh, talked about here, and I guess I, this is, sort of goes to my question a bit, is when you think about the economic identity of the Space Coast here, two big, two big components, uh, well, tourism certainly, but much of it is, uh, is NASA and, uh, and also the uh, port and what's been happening in the port is, is incredible in a very fantastic way. And so how can the, uh, uh, is, there, is there more that can be done? And it's been talked about the uh, ELU, the enhanced land use that uh, I'm, I'm pleased to see is, is going through uh, some of the process there. I've, I've had some experience with that at, at a base in my facility and uh, it's part of the total living experience getting through that bureaucracy. So good luck with all of that. But uh, I, I think as we think about the potential or the possibility of a rail spur, uh, the first thing that you would think about would be the uh, security concerns about that, and I'm appreciative of that. I sit on the rail subcommittee on the transportation infrastructure, but really one of my primary <coughs> responsibilities in the Congress is sitting on Homeland Security, the Vice Chair of the uh, House Homeland Security. So I'm very familiar with the kinds of new technologies that have been utilized for rail security. And believe me, it can happen. There could, there could be an extremely high level of confidence uh, about the security of a rail spur uh, coming off, uh, coming out of the port. And I just sort of throw that out there because when you think about the Panama Canal being expanded, I know that's part of the overall long-term master plan for the region here so that you're able to accommodate the larger uh, uh, salties. And um, <clears throat> having an intermodal uh, component is, is a very important thing, obviously, for the entire region. So, uh, I would just mention uh, as well about um, what, what your thoughts are uh, about the security concerns uh, for uh, the possibility of a, of a rail spur coming up, utilizing the existing rail uh, through here. Yes, ma'am. So uh, I'm still waiting to see the results of this study. And after this study is complete, then we can make an informed decision. Still waiting to see the results of the study, and after the study is complete, then we will we'll be able to make an informed uh, decision. It will also require uh, an environmental impact statement, but we're going to work with the board uh, to see uh, how we can get to accommodating that. And uh, you know, the rail, as it goes right now, doesn't reach as far as it needs to. Uh, we also we have to provide access. The board's going to have to figure out how to get from where the rail ends the rest of the way to the board. But uh, we have easements with. Uh, in a number of our agreements, we're sure it's something that we'd be able to work if this ends up being the right thing to do. But it's still in the study phase, but uh, we're very uh, cautious, cautiously optimistic that we'll get to a solution that's a benefit to, uh, to both of us. So I'm looking forward to the results of that study. And I, I believe that we can make security work. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. Security is a huge concern. It goes into who we allow on site, what companies that we allow in. We don't just allow anybody in. And, uh, you know, that is extremely important when you're dealing with the assets that we're dealing with. But we've also, uh, and I'll mention, you know, we have an agreement with Space Florida for Exploration Park. It's a research and development park on uh, NASA property, but outside the secure perimeter. It allows easier access for uh, foreign nationals and so on. Uh, and they are hopefully going to be building, uh, right now it's anchored with the Space Life Sciences Lab, but uh, soon uh, another building is going to be added and hopefully that will grow into an area where commercial companies can operate and build and be in close proximity to the Space Center without actually being inside the secure perimeter. So security is a, a very important concern. Thank you. And if I could, uh, General, I'm going to ask you another question since I have limited amount of time here. We, uh, uh, you were indicating yesterday in the tour about um, the drone that was here, uh, the drone, the land station, and the drone for the uh, Customs and Border Protection, uh, the CBP. I, uh, I, I think as we think about uh, future BRACs, the Base Realignment and Closure Commission, I mean, the country might not have the stomach right now for another BRAC, but there will be another BRAC. Another BRAC is going to come. And uh, I think as you look at what could happen here, even on Patrick, really, but uh, the, the, the idea of the total force concept of the partnerships again, uh, with the Department of Homeland Security, I often tell the Secretary, the Secretaries of Homeland Security that we really they miss the boat many times with these BRACs by not being proactive, by looking at some of the existing
properties, particularly geographically sited around the uh, country, for uh, more of the uh, components of homeland security. And I, I don't know about the, the drone, but there are, I think, various kinds of things when you think about the maritime environment, the kind of, the kind of challenges that we're all facing, whether it be the Coast Guard or the CBP, Air Force, etc. Not only national security, but homeland security, about the potential of utilizing uh, some of the facilities here. Uh, so then you're not really looking at a commercial partner, but another agency uh, uh, partnership that uh, I, could, I think could be uh, useful in the immediacy and also long-term planning to, to think about BRACs. Because I'll tell you, the next BRAC, total force concept, is going to be a critical element of that. They're going to look at not just one element of DOD, or they'll look at other agencies and those kinds of things when they look at the facilities throughout the inventory, domestically in particular, I think. Do you have any comment on that, John? Thank you, Congresswoman Miller. I do, um, you know, we, we, we work closely with our mission partners uh, even today, and we, uh, you know, together are uh, ensuring the viability of, of the space program here, but, but even beyond the space program, we have already a, a joint force uh, with us, if you will. Um, the Navy is, on Cape Canaveral already, uh, that is no to the Naval Operations Test Unit. Uh, they they test uh, the Trident missile uh, force. Uh, we work uh, with the Army. Uh, they have land down around the port, uh, as well as the Coast Guard has a, a squadron down there around the port. We already work with the Department of State, who has a flying unit at Patrick Air Force Base where they do a lot of the maritime interdiction, drug interdiction, um, and even other uh, kinds of flying in, in combat areas, but they keep their aircraft at Patrick. Um, so I know that we have uh, you know, great property with a lot of potential, a uh, great place to fly, if you will, uh, certainly a great place to launch rockets. But for any new customer that comes to us, we have to look at mission compatibility. Um, I, I'm entrusted with one mission, and that has to come first. And so we have to look at the safety, not only of the uh, incoming customer, but the public safety uh, that, that I'm entrusted with for the space launch business. We look at security as well. We look at encroachment. Um, uh, environmental issues are very important to us, as well as radio frequency emissions, we, we can't interfere uh, in radio wave speak with uh, the way we do business as well. So uh, we, while we think that there's a lot of opportunity, we also I also have to balance the fact that I can't decrease the value of the military value of Patrick or Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Posey. Uh, thank you again, uh, Mr. Chairman, not only for this uh, hearing, but also the time that you have taken and, and the members here have taken to get up to speed on some of these subjects. They're not something that typically a member of Congress goes around uh, having a knowledge of what's going on at this port, what's going on at this space center, uh, what's going on at this Cape. And I, I appreciate the members' time uh, and interest they took to prepare themselves for this hearing today. Uh, accountability is, is something that uh, our citizens want. Uh, unfortunately, uh, many times elected officials, uh, in general, Congress in particular, are too busy uh, to give any attention to accountability. There are other important matters that we are seeing more on the, on the uh, border at the time, but, but you have been diligent trying to bring better accountability, and, and I'm very grateful to you for that. Uh, the same can be said for space. Uh, not, as you see by voting trends in the past, there is really not a whole lot of uh, overwhelming, at least, support in Congress for our nation's space program, uh, even though it is a matter of our national security. It is a matter of our uh, technological and economic advancement in this nation, and and ultimately, it will be responsible for the survival of our species. I recently heard, was honored to hear, a lecture by uh, 
Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I think is uh, one of the most amazing ambassadors for space program. Uh, and he brought out the point that funding for space is probably the only thing that Congress does that entirely uh, is beneficial to the next generation. Most of the other money that we spend solve problems on Earth and in America or around the world for this generation here and now. Very little we do is truly focused on future generations. Uh, and, and space is one of that <coughs> point of focus. Uh, I wish uh, and hope that someday we can make a commitment to our space program maybe 1% of our budget for 25 years is straight line, so you can have some idea of what the future is going to be, uh, so we can properly plan and prepare for, for, for future space endeavors. Um, I want to again go on record that I, I strongly support uh, whatever efforts it takes to get rail services the chairman has long had an interest in, and as uh, uh, Ms. Miller has mentioned earlier here today, to our port. I, I don't think that should be something that's unachievable, you know, given the fact that, that we could put men on the moon and bring them back uh, within a 10-year span. Uh, we've had about 40 years to get a rail spur of the Cape, and, and, I, and I don't think that should be uh, a superhuman super feat if we focus proper attention on it. So uh, I appreciate you giving me the time to participate in this hearing and, and to comment, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I yield back. Thank you. Uh, let me. Uh, over a couple of questions here. Okay, so we have this 2002 plan and the plan that you referred to, Mr. Director, and uh, Mr. Lee said that uh, that uh, plan really looks at divesting at least to uh, mother preservation or mother nature's uh, uh, stewardship um, the land north of uh, 402. Is that correct? Sir, our plan is not, there is no plan for any NASA development north of 402. But then we have the Shiloh project. Uh, is that, that's north of 402? Yes, that's okay. Space Florida. Okay. And I understand that the firm that's looking at that is looking at also acquiring land. Would that be title land? Could that be title land to them, or uh, lease land? Is that? I thought you had said everything had to be leased. If we were to do it, we would not want to give up ownership of that land. Okay. But it would appear to me that there might be space below 402 for that uh, that type of activity, keeping uh, what Mr. Lee's come to request, uh, uh, sort of pristine from that type of development. Is that a possibility, or is that, uh, is that being looked at? In our master plan, we have looked at another launch site just north of Pad 39B. It would be, you could call it 39C or some other name, but we've looked at the, the possibility of developing a Bringing site. that closer to the 402. I notice 402 does, uh, uh, we've got it up here. Right. It, it would be closer to it, but it would be on the south side. Okay, okay. Uh, that would make Mr. Lee happy. Uh, the record would reflect he's got two thumbs back on <laughs> a grin on his face. Well, again, um, you know, it's amazing how things change. You know, Mr. DeSantis has the area in Volusia County, uh, Canaveral National Seashore Park. The biggest thing I had, Ron, to worry about, uh, which was more than, well, my first 10 years, was uh, the new uh, bathing on the beach there. And uh, now you guys have been, uh, acquired the responsibility of, the, uh, of this transition. Uh, this is a huge piece of property. I mean, this is, a, I asked them how big is Manhattan? What, what is it, 37 square miles? This is 240 uh, square miles, just your part, not, not to the Air Force. Um, and uh, it stretches a long way. It's got a lot of value. And you don't want to be short-sighted. I mean, they have two strong advocates over here. Well, the whole panel, is, I think, are strong advocates for the space program. We don't want to leave ourselves short-sighted for the future. 
But you feel that the plan that was adopted in 2012, uh, again, utilizing that land south, uh, south of 402, would be sufficient to carry our mission to any foreseeable future. Director and General. The plan? Yes, no? Uh, for NASA's needs, yes. General? Mr. Chairman, thank you for the question. I am not familiar with the plan because that's not okay. Air Force problem. Well, I want you to look at the plan and then comment for the record. You got two weeks to do that report back, okay? Yes, and sir. if you have to go above, ask them if they think it's adequate. And then if there's anything dis disposable that you can dispose of, or of course, we, uh, we're, no one wants to preclude the, what, what's been talked about here for economic development of the port. That's a big economic generator. We heard um, Coos Coosman uh, testify, 250 jobs, you gave the amount of investment to uh, Walsh. What kind of jobs could we have if we had the port connection and the additional land there? Our Guesstimate. Our, our projections are 5,000 within the next 5,000 five to 7. To south. My goal would be we've gone from 18,000 down to 8,000, and I think you've started actually, he didn't get credit for it, uh, the director did, but he, I think he, we hit bottom and now we are employing people using some of these facilities. So our goal would be get it packed past that 18,000, uh, not only with the space activity, but also other economic potential. So that, that's, that's a very significant figure. Um, all right, GSA. Uh, you have the 54,000, and here again, the director didn't give himself much credit. You showed us a building yesterday that was that you were transferring other government activities into. What, what, how big was that space, and what what's the the, the director? Yeah, which one? I'm trying to remember. Oh, um, but you uh, you were telling us that you had moved into another agency into um, a building, and it was going to occupy. Was that one of yours? Or the no, no. Then what I was talking about was we were moving into. Uh, my engineering team and consolidated. I moved all my engineering uh, directors. That was the building in the front. Is that the, the one across from the vehicle assembly? No, but we passed another building, and I thought you said that they were going to have uh, someone come into that from another agency. That was a building also that we leased with uh, Space Florida that was part of the OPF A3. Okay, so that's a private. That's a private building. Okay, then, uh, with Smith. You got 54,000 square feet from him? Yes, sir. How long have you had it? I think reporter access came about January time frame. When? This year? This year. Okay. I hope some of that's prompted by the Chimney <laughs> Committee. Uh, Smith will be, uh, I'm sure I'll see you again, and I'll be asking you the status of, of uh, making that available or whatever we're going to do with it. And since I've got you here for another one, um, I think we're making some progress on the dire corridor. So we're six or seven years now vacant in Miami. Sir, we're working with Miami Dade. I, I appreciate that. I got the report back. They're interested in a potential lease. How long do you think that's all going to take to, to uh, review and get a decision on? We're, we're supposed to sit down with them. We're looking for a, a good win-win situation. Could you tell me, uh, the committee, uh, provide me in the next two weeks when you plan to sit down with them and then give me chronological order and, um, for submission in this record as to what time th uh, frame do you think that that could be accomplished? I will. Okay, I just had uh, uh, Dr. Padron and others that, that this is a vacant courthouse, I think we're going six or seven years now in Miami, and we've had two hearings, one at the community college, which is across the street from the vacant federal courthouse, where we did our first hearing about two years ago. We're going on, getting up to two years, yeah. All right, so again, uh, sorry to give you a hard time, Mr. Smith, that's what, what I'm getting paid for, uh, but right sizing this uh, property, uh, is a challenge both for NASA and also uh, for the Air Force. Now, let's go back to Cusman. Uh, did 
would you tell us if you, from the outside, you, you've had to deal with this in a big way, getting your foothold here. Anything we can do to speed up the process, your recommendation? They're not going to cancel your lease, at, less, at least not this week, so just be frank with us. <laughs> Listen, you'd be surprised how hard it is to get people to testify. I mean, really, it is. I mean, I, we've done some of these federal property, and I can't get a witness. I've offered a bag over their head and a screen, and they won't come near us uh, to, to talk because they're afraid of retribution from either GSA or some federal agency. But you're, uh, you've got a, a pass here. Go ahead and tell us anything positive that would help the process from your, what you've seen. Thank you, sir. Uh, I think one of the things that, that may get lost at times is that uh, uh, Space Board is accountable to the Office of the Governor, so our requirements are a little different than some of our federal partners. Um, and we're looking at that partnership between the two to be beneficial to us, right, to be able to track those customers and different things. I think you may have used a great example with six years for a building. All the buildings, I think, that a lot of, many of the buildings that the director showed you uh, OPF 1, OPF 3, right? The ONC building, Launch Complex 41, it was modified for ELV, the Space Life Science Lab, right? The ROV hangar at the shuttle interstate, all those, right, were uh, in fact Space Florida, where Florida has put resources in there to draw those companies here. And so it is, it's tough to transition those facilities. You have to find the right partners. We do a lot of diligence with all those too, so. Okay. It's been, I mean, it's pretty amazing. And, uh, three years is the last of launch, was it, to, out of uh, 39? Yeah. But again, my question for the record is, is there anything you can recommend to the committee? We'll go back, look at legislation, we'll look at kicking agencies in the tail to move them forward, whatever it takes. Anything you want to offer today? Uh, sir, I think we, we look Or you can submit for the record if you don't want to. I think uh, I'd like to submit for the record. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that option, sir. All right, well, again, um, our goal here is to take this incredible national treasure uh, it's got that's got a little bit of uh, rust and a little mold uh, uh, from some of it sitting idle, but to, to brush it off and to see what we can do with it to, to turn it into the very best asset for the taxpayers and then hopefully get jobs and economic activity, get the private sector involved as they should be in the space mission as a good partner. And then from our defense standpoint, this is a very important asset and maximizing that too. Uh, finally, Gen uh, General, how many launch uh, pads are empty and how many are being used just for the record?
lot of focus by the Air Force and NASA on commercial space. That's why the Space Party exists. Um, you know, there was a time when uh, America virtually had a monopoly on commercial space. 100% of the satellites fundamentally were launched from right here. Um, under the old business model with NASA and the Air Force, we basically choked the Golden Goose to death uh, with red tape and overregulation, uh, launch fees, and, and other um, disincentives. Uh, many of the commercial space industry found it much more advantageous to operate in other countries, where in fact, instead of overregulating uh, and, and essentially taxing the commercial space industry, they subsidized it. And so pretty soon it be, became not very competitive and, and we went from 100% of the world's commercial launch mm -hmm. business to probably less than 10%. We're trying to get that back now. Um, at one point, there was a master plan signed uh, by the Air Force, by NASA, by Space Florida, uh, everyone with an interest in saying we would have a commercial uh, launch center inside the gates of the Space Center. And, and uh, we call it a range within the range. Uh, we know, of course, uh, that all this is subject to the Air Force's dominion of every inch of airspace, probably from Jacksonville to Miami, uh, they control. And so while it's often easy to say, well, why don't people run in and use some of these other empty launch pads? And there's some practical reasons why. Uh, if you're on pad one and I'm on pad two, and we have different launch schedules, there's times when you can't do anything if I'm right next door with them. So, I mean, just some practical things that you don't think about. People say, well, they've got unused launch pads, simply just use those. But there's other reasons for doing that. Um, there's also infrastructure cost um, that I'm going to put into a long-term investment if I have a long-term commitment for it. And I'm not going to put in that long-term investment if I don't have the long-term commitment. So. Um, what I'm kind of driving at uh, is to follow up on your question that you asked for responses to. Uh, if not Shiloh, uh, tell the chairman where you think a range within a range, uh, uh, viable uh, future launch operations for commercial space uh, would be located, if not Shiloh. If you would include that in your responses to the uh, chairman in the next couple of weeks, I'd appreciate it. Thank you, and we will leave the record open for a period of two weeks, and we'll have additional questions we'll be submitting to the witnesses that we will enter in the record also. Um, uh, first of all, again, I have to thank our witnesses. Uh, Director Kaman is a pretty modest guy in his presentation here today. I was very impressed with him yesterday, um, and I'll never forget standing with him in the VA Vehicle Assembly Building, VA. which is uh, one of the largest single structure buildings, I think, in the world. Uh, somebody told me, you can see it in the movie, but he told me that, uh, he told me he came, I guess, as a naval cadet and came into that building many, many years ago. Uh, uh, young naval guy, and uh, who would have thought that he would be directing, actually, the, the future of that many, many years later. But I, I was very impressed because sometimes we'll pick people who uh, aren't always the best choices to direct some of these operations. But here's a guy that started out from the very beginning um, to uh, and having experience in the programs and astronaut, a whole host of activities, and then ends up here. So I think it's a very good choice. Uh, and was, we were impressed with what we saw yesterday. We've lit a fire under them, quite frankly, the last year, and so has Congress the last couple of years to move forward to various committees, uh, particularly uh, science, uh, space and science committee. But uh, our intent is, again, on behalf of the people, and uh, also I think we're fortunate to get to the general here, um, Armanio, because um, she had experience at Vandenberg, said at the perfect time, uh, Mr. Mr. Posey and I had heard the just say no uh, for long enough, and 
uh, she has a, a vision, hopefully, for the future that we can uh, work with. And, uh, Mr. Smith, uh, he continues to take my abuse and get returns to GSA uh, and, and does it all uh, very cheerfully and hasn't hired anyone to take me out yet. Um, and uh, uh, again, I was excited to hear from uh, Mr. Kuzma. Um, they've actually uh, broken through all of this and have a number of exciting projects that will that are and will be employing people and get us to the next uh, uh, level of activity uh, in, in uh, space competition nationally and internationally. Mr. Lee, always the protector of the environment with the Audubon Society, uh, and went, uh, hopefully go away with a semi-smiling face today, but always there doing a good job and uh, <coughs> protecting again our natural treasures. And thanks, Mr. Walsh, uh, for participating. Uh, uh, I think of all the things I heard when you said 5,000 jobs, if that doesn't make you salivate, nothing uh, will. So uh, hopefully we can expedite uh, where we all want to get, and that's in a positive direction. There being no further business uh, before the subcommittee today, uh, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thanks for coming out and uh, uh, listening to the hearing today. Today's, uh, today's hearing uh, brought uh, our congressional panel to this part of uh, Florida just to look at uh, 144,000 acres. That's uh, uh, over 240 square miles, that's about eight times the size of Manhattan federal property, which has been involved in the space program for half a century. With a new mission, we're looking at a uh, number of possibilities to bring additional jobs, uh, to expand uh, the port. Uh, we heard today uh, possibly uh, 5,000 additional jobs to an industry here that's gone from 18,000 to 8,000 jobs. So um, we're trying to do everything we can to uh, turn the properties around, the, the assets that are sitting idle, the property and buildings and facilities, and get a return for the taxpayers. Congressman, is it a concern that some of these properties have been sitting for too long, in your opinion? Well, uh, some have been sitting for too long. Uh, we heard today there are many uh, facilities, launch sites, uh, I think that we, we missed the boat in not uh, commercializing or privatizing earlier, and other countries uh, have taken advantage of, it, of us. Now we need to get back in that race, uh, make the United States the leader in the space industry with the commercial activity in partnership with the federal government, but also many other uses of this property, some uh, natural preserve. We heard the Audubon Society say, a good part of the uh, property, and those birds are chirping there to uh, also uh, chime in that they want uh, some uh, preserved uh, lands, but uh, we, we can look at uh, the whole uh, selection of opportunities for an incredible piece of real estate. What do you think about the, the uh, commercial launch pad proposal at Shiloh? Well, uh, to, too, so today uh, uh, we did hear, again, opposition to Shiloh. Uh, but I think there's plenty of room for shallow. Again, we have a huge area here. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, something can be worked out. Today we heard one possibility raised by the uh, NASA director uh, of a location a little bit closer to CAD 39 and closer to, uh, to uh, Highway 402, which I think would uh, hopefully satisfy them. But again, I don't know their requirements. We, we just have to see uh, how that can be worked out to uh, encroach as little as possible on the area that we want to preserve. Well, you, you heard the KSC director and the 45th Space Wing leader both say, "Look, we've got we've got too much, uh, too many regulations. We've got we've got too many things that we're responsible to do. We can't make way for for commercial property or uses very easily." What did you think of those response? They they were not willing to. 
to open the door completely to private uh, to private use. They were saying, you know, we've got stuff that we're responsible to do that we can't uh, just make it that easy. Well, Congress has given them specific uh, directives, both in a 2010 uh, authorization for NASA and uh, most recently in the budget we finished a few uh, months ago for right-sizing the, these properties and these facilities. So uh, we're going to go back and look at what is um, delaying any of our conversion, what's delaying uh, bringing jobs and commercial activity here, and then utilizing to the absolute max uh, the property that's here, which are assets for the taxpayers that uh, shouldn't sit idle. You came down and had a chance to take a tour, yeah. see things firsthand. Um, overall, a little, little, things a little better or worse well, than you expected uh, before you arrived? We've been prodding, we've been prodding NASA for a, a year now. I've had a, uh, one investigator assigned to this project. Uh, actually, I'm somewhat pleased with some of the progress that I saw. Uh, the conversion of um, the, the, the launch. Uh, pads to commercial, uh, the vehicle assembly building, uh, conversion of that huge structure, um, and then uh, other activities that are coming here, both for private space activities and then for other agencies to utilize vacant federal property. So uh, maybe a, tor a tortoise pace, I'd like to get us to uh, Greyhound uh, race uh, uh, speed, but uh, we'll get there. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you.